Today's trip takes us to Braunsbach, which lies a few kilometers north of Swedish Hall by the side of the Cocker River and near to the A6 motorway, which leads to Nuremberg. So I've made it here to Braunsbach, and the first thing to note is that uh, parking isn't obvious. Although I did ask somebody and they've sent me down here, come through a little archway, and there's a nice parking space here. But there is a sign over there that says uh, it floods in high water. The river is just over there. So, first impressions of the town. It's quite nice here. I'm on uh, Market Square and I've just noticed there's a little exhibition here of the flood that, was, that happened in 2016. So, that'll be my first port of call. And then we'll start the tour about the Braunsbach Jews. Never seen one of these before. If your bike breaks down, <laughs> all the tools here that you can fix them up with. This is in the exhibition of uh, the flood that happened in 2016. Um, it's just a load of pictures here, but it's quite interesting to see how devastating it was. The Braunsbach Jews were mostly active as merchants and accounted for up to one third of the population in the town until 1942 when the last 12 Jews were deported. Bit of an ironic number that. Chetel Lippmann built the house in 1752 and lived in it until his death in 1791. Chetel lived in Braunsbach as a protected Jew and probably held a letter of protection. That would have allowed him to live here and marry. The letter could be passed in some cases to the oldest son. Chetl's son was also a protected Jew. I think it's reasonable to assume this is what happened. The descendants of Chetl and Abraham emigrated to America in 1890 after they had changed their name to Gudman in 1820. Most of the Jewish population lived in the street, which was the shortest way to the synagogue. This is important because on the Sabbath, Jews were not meant to walk more than a thousand steps. In the house number 10, matzah were made according to strict Jewish laws of cleanliness, which would be controlled by the rabbi. Matzah is unleavened bread eaten during the Passover, which is celebrated to commemorate the time when the Jews were freed from Egyptian slavery. Why two doors into the same house? The law at the time stated that Christians and Jews should not live together, but here in Braunsbach they did live very close together, and to circumvent this rule the house had two doors, one for Johann Moore, Christian, and one for Simon Jung, Jew. Behind what's now a sports and entertainment hall, stands the earlier synagogue. It was built in 1732 by Johann Friedrich Einbrenner and cost 1,070 gulden. It was ransacked in the pogrom of 10th of November 1938. The house contained an apartment for the rabbi and one for the teacher and included classrooms for the Israeli school. The building also had a so-called remis where the hearse used by the town Jews was stored. Interestingly enough, animals were also butchered in the building.
Well, I'm here in Barnsbach, or Bronsbach, sorry. And up to now, I have to say it's been totally underwhelming. The signs for the various places, there's supposed to be nine stops, and the signs for the various stops are very confusing. War Memorial, I haven't even found. I was on my way to the cemetery and I found this pathway. Whether it leads up there or not, I don't know, but it's actually nice. So my impressions of uh, Brownsbach, it's a very nice town, it's a very pretty town, very, very clean. But it did have that flood, so whether it's cleanliness has to do with the rebuilding or whether it's uh, always like that, I don't know. But it is a very nice town. The people seem very friendly. The area itself is very nice, but whether it was worth driving three quarters of an hour to get here, once I find the cemetery, I can perhaps um, make a decision. I did find a couple of the houses, and they were quite interesting. One of them was lived in by yeah, well they're both lived in by families, that was the house, both the houses on Altsgasser. And I found the site of the almshouse, but there's nothing there except a sign. It was a bit of a shame. I went to the, uh, yeah, what's the museum now, but it's closed. But I, I could have come, it's only open to, I think it was the second Sunday and the fourth Sunday in month. And seeing as now I'm on the last Sunday, it's going to be two weeks. No, it's not loud, it's not a, yesterday it was the last Sunday. It's going to be another two weeks before I, before it's open, so I can't really go in there. Let's, I found the Schloss, which a little bit sad. Synagogue, well you can't see anything of it, or I couldn't find anything to do anything with it. It's all been replaced by a sports hall, and it all looks so spanking brand new that you can't even imagine anything behind it. The only thing that might be is uh, the front. It might look like it's a bit older, but I'm not even so sure about that. I did look at some old pictures and they do look kind of similar, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit further up here and see where it goes to. And then if it doesn't come to the cemetery then I have to go back down again and walk along the road there. So let's see what happens. I walked around the stanchion and uh, I mean, it is quite an amazing thing to look at, to be honest, and then looked up the stanchion towards the motorway above me. And I did note that uh, the grass around was uh, a little bit bare in just that little patch there. And I wondered at first why that might be. But uh, then unfortunately, I think I found the reason. This is uh, Daniel and Colin said. 